for that family, that's the thing that they're going to walk away with. They're going to walk away with the image of the honor guard and how great they look. They're going to remember the band playing the hymns. They're going to remember the sound of the cadence, drum cadence as they come down the hill. But they will always, always remember the bugler and the notes of taps. Of all the military bugle calls, none is so easily recognized or more apt to evoke emotion than the call taps. From your United States Air Force Band, this is the Connection Series, a podcast that examines the intersections between the military, music, and storytelling. I'm your host, Master Sergeant Brooke Emery. Today on our show, we talk about the origin of taps with one of America's leading experts on military bugle calls. In our second segment, we examine military honors in a broader way, as a member of the United States Air Force Ceremonial Brass demystifies what actually happens during a full honors funeral at Arlington National Cemetery. We can trace its origin back to the Civil War, uh, the summer of 1862, when Union General Daniel Butterfield decided to use that call as a replacement call for the uh, call of lights out that was used at the time. The call was actually called Extinguish Lights. That's Yari Villanueva. He spent 23 years with the United States Air Force Band in Washington, D.C., and is considered to be the country's foremost expert on military bugle calls. During his career, he oversaw the arrival and departure ceremonies for the late presidents Reagan and Ford, and participated as a trumpeter and drum major in over 5,000 ceremonies at Arlington National Cemetery. And in 2007, he was inducted into the Bugler's Hall of Fame. And that call, like all, all the other bugle calls used in the U.S. infantry, were calls derived from fr- French manuals. Now, the original call for, for lights, lights out or extinguished lights was this call. That's the call that would have been heard in the evening to um to order lights out. Well, Butterfield decided that the the call for extinguished lights was just too formal sounding. So he, along with his brigade bugler, a 23-year-old bugler by the name of Oliver Wilcox Norton, they got together and they revised actually an older bugle call that had fallen out of use prior to the Civil War. They they revised the last part of that into the 24 notes that we know uh, today as taps, lights out, was followed on the parade field by a lone drummer who would strike the, the, the drum three times, tap, tap, tap. That was the drum signal for also extinguished lights. Soldiers started would call that the drum taps. So when the when the new bugle call comes into use, they naturally start calling the new bugle call taps. That's where the origin of the the word comes from. Of course, there's been many myths associated with the creation of taps, and the the most popular one is that of a Union captain who hears the cries of a soldier on the battlefield, and he he crawls out to to pull the soldier back, and uh, it turns out it's a Confederate soldier, and when he flips the soldier over, he finds out to his horror that it's his son who he thought he had sent off uh, to a music school to avoid the war, but here he is now. Um, in front of him dying. Um, unfortunately, the, the young man dies, and in the pocket of his uniform are notes that are scribbled out, and supposedly those are the notes of taps, uh, which he, the Union captain has performed at the young man's funeral. Well, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful story and certainly incorporates the, the, the feeling of the Civil War, the horror of the Civil War, but it's just that. It, it's, it's a myth, and it was actually thought of by all people, um, by 
a guy who did uh, Ripley's Believe It or Not. Robert Ripley, who was a cartoonist, um, thought of the idea of this story uh, for a television show in the late 1940s. Uh, But as his biographer pointed out, even for Ripley, the story was just a little too far-fetched. It is. It's a little bit too sad to be real. True. But yeah. like any good myth, it incorporated things that were um, happening at the time because the myth states that it took place down near Harrison's Landing during the summer of 1862. So there's little bits of truth. Bits of in truth. It. <laughs> yep. I've heard taps actually started to be used by the Confederate side as well. Is that true? We're not absolutely sure uh, that they use it, but certainly the Confederates would have heard the call being sounded in Union camps as an evening call and would have also used it too. Um, the Confederate uh, Army had you know, bands, they had musicians uh, as part of the Army, so it was n- probably not uncommon that the, they may have used it by the end of the war. How did it come to be used at military funerals? The story is that Shortly after the creation of the call, a an artillery officer um, decided to use the call at a funeral for one of one of his men, figuring that having the three volley gun salute rifle salute was a little too much because they were so close to uh, enemy lines that he supposedly said to the bugler, "Just sound this new call." Um, certainly by the end of the Civil War, it becomes associated with military funerals. And then after the war, uh, with all the memorial services that are held, in fact, the first memorial service at Arlington is actually held in 1868, um, groups are using the call at military funerals. So by the end of the, the 19th century, it's it's used all the time. In fact, it, it takes a long time for it actually to go into the manuals. E- even after the Civil War, it's used at military funerals. It doesn't officially become part of the official protocol until 1891. Uh, but like I said, it ha- was used, we, we know for sure. I think probably the most famous Taps story is that of Keith Clark. Right. Sergeant Keith Clark of the United States Army Band was, he was the principal bugler at the time that uh, President Kennedy was assassinated. Uh, the military district of Washington had no real plans for the death of a president uh, because no one had thought such a young, vibrant president would ever be lost. One of the things that they had overlooked in the planning was a bugler and a firing party. And it actually wasn't into the very early hours of the funeral on Monday, November 25th, that Clark was contacted by his commander that he would be the one performing. They put him in a, a, an unfortunate situation, very close to the firing party, almost actually almost in front of the firing party because they wanted to get a perfect shot for television. Uh, because of that, when the time came for him to perform, he had been standing out in the cold for a long period of time. The firing party fired very close to his ears, which must have deafened him. Um, but he was able to, to, to sound a very beautiful tap, except for one note that he, he missed. Of course, that's the bane of every trumpet player and every bugler who goes out to Arlington. You want to play it perfectly, but sometimes a note will get away from you. And that one note was, of course, heard by millions around the world, and it's still talked about to this very day. Keith Clark um, lived with that. To me, I always think of like Bill Buckner of the Boston Red right. Sox, letting that ball go through. And, and of course, when Bill passed away uh, just recently, you know, headlines were you know the, about about the missed um, uh, the missed ball. And of course, when Clark passed away, the New York Times had written, you know, the bugler 
who missed note at Kennedy funeral passes away. So he was remembered uh, for that for the rest of his life. However, he, after leaving the army in 1966, news for your podcast here that not generally known, Keith Clark was a member of the United States Air Force Band. Was he really? For a very short period of time, <laughs> yes. Be, when when he enlisted, he uh, was assigned over to the Air Force first for a very short period of time before going over to the Army Band. I had discovered this in uh, some write-ups of Clark, um, and I found that incredibly fascinating. Uh, I was able to interview him several times, and I treasure some of the letters that I received from him, and I've been in touch with his family. And still, that note, like I like to say, is always going to be with us, like the, like the crack in the Liberty Bell. It's part of our American folklore. It certainly is. You know, the funny, the most interesting thing, I reread that account in preparation for this interview, was the fact that he didn't realize that he had chipped the note till he got home. And his daughter said, why did you mess up? And they, they had all groaned when it happened on television. I, I completely understood that because when you're in the moment in a pressure situation like that, what your brain will filter out in order to just get that job done. Absolutely. I can't say enough about somebody like him because here he was put into a situation that was the most incredible pressure situation for any musician to ever be part of. It's something that military musicians learn to live with and, and, and learn to be able to perform at such a high level under pressure. And to me, it's, 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 it's a wonderful thing. And I'm always proud and always uh, at times envious of guys who could do that. The, the few times where I was able to sound it as part of a ceremony at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier were very special to me. Um, talk about pressure. It, it's I've always called it like the Carnegie Hall for buglers. Uh, another one was uh, sounding taps for General Godfrey McHugh, who was the presidential aide to um, John F. Kennedy. Um, that was that was a special ceremony. Uh, of course, every ceremony that I've ever sounded taps at Arlington was important. I belong to an organization called Taps for Veterans, and we're one of the organizations throughout the United States that helps provide live buglers where, when needed uh, at military funerals. And one of the things I do in my retirement is to go out and sound taps at funerals, and it's something that that I'm honored to do, and I think it's a, a very worthy thing. And and for for trumpet players out there, if, if you want to give back after your military career, or even if you haven't had a military career and you'd love to give something back, sounding taps at military funerals is is a great way to show um, show your appreciation for our country. Yari Villanueva, thank you so much for being here with us today. It's my honor. Arlington National Cemetery is our nation's premier military cemetery. And it's a busy place, with over 150 funerals taking place every single week. And one of the questions members of the United States Air Force Band get asked most often is what exactly happens during those ceremonies. So we asked Senior Master Sergeant Daniel Valady to take us through a military full honors funeral with escort. Sergeant Valady has been a member of the United States Air Force Band for 21 years, the last four of which he has served as the drum major of the ceremonial brass, a unit devoted to carrying out the congressionally mandated mission of supporting these funerals. Here he is, discussing the event in his own words. Full honors funerals at Arlington National Cemetery. It's probably one of the most significant jobs that we do in the ceremonial brass. Um, they're very personal, especially to the family involved. Obviously, it's, it's something that's very personal to them. It's uh, as close as we can get of a direct connection without actually being able to make a direct connection with the uh, family members because we don't actually talk to them or deal with them. Um, but obviously, it's something that's very intimate to uh, their lives and their experiences with the military. So we do about 400 per year, um, and the ceremony 
sort of lays out in three acts, almost like a play. Um, and in the first act, um, the family uh, with the remains and the Arlington uh, National Cemetery rep, they show up at a transfer point, which is just a designated point in the cemetery. Um, and at that point, they will transfer the remains of the deceased from the from the hearse to the caisson. And symbolically, it's almost like uh, tr- uh, taking the individual or the remains from just its close, intimate family and having it join its military family. So we will stand at attention. Um, the commander of troops will bring the formation to attention when the remains and the family arrive at the transfer point. And then while they're getting out of their cars and waiting, we'll go back and stand at uh, ceremonial at ease. And then we'll come back to attention and we'll play a hymn as they transfer the remains from the hearse to the caisson. The caisson being, uh, for those unfamiliar, it's about six horses with a, another lead horse and it's a, a drawn carriage, I guess is one way to put it. It's, it's a, a flatbed um, with uh, wooden wheels on it um, that they'll either have um, the casket remains or it's a empty casket where they put the, the urn if it's a cremated um, set of remains. But we'll play music supporting uh, that movement of the remains. And in general, most of the time when we're playing is to sort of underscore some significant event within the ceremony. And in particular, any time that the remains are moved is a significant event. So we'll play for that. Um, After the remains have finished being moved, uh, the family will go back to their cars. uh, And then when we're all ready to go and everyone's lined up, uh, we proceed to Act 2 of the ceremony. Act 2 for us is the procession where the uh, military escort, which is the flight of honor card troops and the band and the color team, uh, the military escorts its family member, its military member's remains from the transfer point all the way to its finding rest, final resting place at the gravesite. Uh, so that procession acts uh, like a parade. If you would see it, you would think that it looks like a parade with the family's vehicles um, behind the, the caisson and with the military escort leading the way for the caisson. Once we get to the gravesite, we're sort of at Act 3, which is all of the various ceremonial things that happen at the gravesite. The first one of which is, uh, again, we perform a hymn to support the movement of the remains to the actual gravesite from the caisson. So again, taking it from the caisson all the way to its final resting place. Once we're there and the family is in, uh, in their seats by the gravesite, the chaplain will give their committal where they um, both talk a little bit about Arlington National Cemetery and the significance of that place, as well as the sacrifice of the individual military members. They'll try to comfort the family um, and try to develop some sort of 
uh, close relationship with they can with uh, the family as much as they can. So a lot of the really intimate interaction for that ceremony comes from the chaplain and their relationship with the family. Um, once they're finished with the committal, um, we'll all come to attention for final honors. So there'll be three volleys from the firing party, um, and then there'll be the performance of taps by a solo bugler. Following that, um, they'll do the last portion of honors, which is to fold the flag to present to the family. So as they're doing it again, another emotionally significant moment um, in the ceremony, the, the band will play the Air Force hymn, Lord, Guard, and Guide, um, and that will underscore the flag folding. Um, after the honor guard has finished folding the flag, They'll present it to the chaplain, and the chaplain will present it to the next of kin, to the family. Um, and then the Arlington ladies, which um, have been a great organization that has supported uh, both the families of the those who were deceased at Arlington Cemetery, um, as well as been really supportive and helpful to the band and the chaplaincy and the honor guard. Um, They'll present a card to the next of kin and sort of welcome them to their ranks. Um, and after that, uh, the ceremony is over. After the, the card has been presented, the flag has been presented, and we've played final honors, the entire military escort will just head back um, to our transportation. So that's sort of how the ceremony functions. Um, all of it acts as a proxy for taking this military member and having uh, that member go from their family, join their military family, and be escorted from their military family to their final resting place, being supported at that final resting place uh, as the, the chaplain can talk about what their sacrifice as individuals means to the country as well as to the family. Um, and having that final military family support them and show them the proper respect and honors uh, for their sacrifice. And so it's a very personal and intimate thing. What the family needs from me, what they need from us as a group, is that strong military presence. They need that support and they need us to do our job well with the same level of excellence and commitment that their family member showed toward the military. Um, I'm very proud to have done that for the past 21 years. This episode was produced by myself, along with Senior Master Sergeant Matthew Irish. Recording and editing help were provided by Senior Master Sergeant Dennis Hoffman, along with Master Sergeants Emily Wellington and Mike Hampf. The executive producer of the United States Air Force Band Connection Series is Colonel Don Schofield. <laughs>